second rate, or just tier two toy line play sets? You decide. I'm Victor and straight out of the gen experience, if you say play sets of the 80s, you'll conjure images of Grayskull, Boulder Hill, Cat's Lair, and of course, the USS Flag and Eternia. But what are the others? The obscure, the upstarts, of which there are dozens, some exciting and underrated, others underwhelming and lackluster. Whatever your opinion, not all can achieve icon status. If you saw our 70s playset show, you're going to love this 80s playsets for action figures and dolls. Before we recall and reminisce, may I ask you to please hit that like and go ahead and click subscribe to help keep the gen experience alive. That's not Grayskull, it's Castle Zendo from The Other World. What is this toy line? Who are these characters? Where do I get them? Oh, I get six of them included in the playset. Because if they were sold separately, I'm not sure anyone was buying. That aside, this fearful yet colorful visage is nothing more than a barricade, a fortress wall to stop invaders from getting in. To what exactly? Who knows? Maybe the other side is the other world. Well, this is a second-rate playset for sure. But at least there are some very defined floors and ladders. Other than that, this other world is pretty sparse on design and action elements. Now don't be shy. Who had this one? Manglors. The toy line that took suspension of disbelief a little too far and paid the price. Manglore Mountain. This playset just added salt to the wound that was this damaged brand. Sure, pull the limbs off your figure and just stick them back on. Or better yet, stick them back onto the ripped limbs of another figure. Surprise! It doesn't work. Maybe some spit will help. Besides the parental outcry of torn toys that were irreparable without crazy glue, it was this one and done toy that took the play out of playset. Manglord rises from his volcanic prison, I think, by the orange primordial ooze. A toy in the 80s should not shy away from the gross factor. If you're going to ooze, why not just get slimed? The Horde slime pit knew what that was all about, although parents hated the stained rugs. For something a little less mess, Mumra's Tomb and Fortress and even Shira's Crystal Falls proved smaller playsets could pack a punch, which left the one gimmick Manglore Mountain knocked out. Unless you consider ladders a play feature, the Eagle's Nest is certainly more of a military playhouse. It has six of their die-cast metal figures included, which I have to admit would have been tempting. But as playsets go, it is more of a staging ground or place to pose the characters in their eagle-shaped rock fortress one of its only saving graces. It's hard not to compare this to she Princess of Power, but to be fair, Golden Girl premiered first. When it comes to playsets, this thing seems to have certainly been an afterthought, or rushed to market. Crystal Castle may have been light on action features, and with the furniture, it feels more like a Barbie dream house for the rebellion of Etheria. But at least both had elevators. Golden Girl's Castle did have a shield that became a compact mirror, the most glamorous dungeon door, and the titular gem to guard. Or as the box said, you could use it as a real flashlight. A handy gadget for any Golden Girl. What Golden Girl seemed to be missing was what she had to offer. A grand and epic castle in the clouds. You can't deny what a little airbrushing can do to elevate a playset. Sometimes it's simply the design flourish. Holograms were like black magic to any kid. And if I were still of my original playtime age when this debuted, I would have finagled a way to get it. The box highlighting ledges to stand on as a selling point should be a red flag. But the whole entrance to the ghost world is just too enticing. Action figures lie in the coffin, the key rotates the coffin, figure is now in the ghost world replaced with holographic secrets, which can only be revealed by the light of the skull head. Oh, another handy flashlight. Leaps and bounds above the 70s bionic man and woman small playsets it may not be second rate, but it is a tier 2 toy line that could not compete with the big boys or get enough shelf space at toy stores to move the merchandise. Oh, and in pure 80s fashion, the coffin becomes a car. Yeah, it has wheels. I guess now it can be part of wacky races. Battle Beasts has its fans, I know. And at first glance, you don't see any traditional playsets. But ah, the Battle Beasts are more than meets the eye. Which is funny since the characters were born of the Transformers, the Japanese headmaster continuity that did not air in the United States. There are so many fantastic vehicles from various toy lines, not to mention incredible Hot Wheels sets, but they deserve their own show at a later date. These troop transports are the Battle Beast's spiritual connection to the Transformers. The little rock, paper, scissor animal warriors vehicles transformed into bases, three very different vehicles that were also carrying cases and playsets. Blazing Eagle, Wood Beetle, and Shocking Shark. 
great names by the way. However, with their diminutive size, there were very few features, and missing was the grand and miraculous beauty of a giant fortress, which leaves these guys in tier 2 position. If it hadn't been for the more infantile nature, this Tonka toy line may have kept their head start, and perhaps today we'd be enduring 12 Michael Bay GoBot movies that nobody asked for. But that wasn't to be, and the more childlike nature of their cartoon translated into the Command Center playset. Both a walking transport for the GoBots and a carrying case, the Command Center has its good side. Hell, I own one. Of course, I don't own one GoBot. But because if you squint your eyes, the playset can stand in for the many levels of the gray and lived-in blue-collar aesthetic of the Nostromo. So yeah, I use it to display my alien action figures. Unfortunately, when you look closer, you will see the more comic tone like the GoBot cafeteria complete with menu and even a wanted poster on the walls of this playset. You are not going to find that lighthearted lean with the more successful Transformers line. But then again, they didn't even get a playset. So the playset is useful, but so is a cheese grater. Once the TV show was canceled, it was lights out for the Captain Power gimmick. However, the toy line was pretty mature. The best example of toy to real world there had ever been. And that sang a lot for its cheesy Saturday morning production. These laser light activated toys could still be a blast long after the show ran its course. Times were changing fast and room on the toy shelves was a premium. The power base was a mid-sized playset where the main action feature was lots of explosions as the box said. Light beam hits would trigger walls, ledges and boulders blowing off the cliff face from the TV firing at your playset. Without the TV show, you'd best have picked up some Captain Power vehicles from the clearance store to assure you had the firing mechanism and targets to get the most bang promised for your buck. The Fright Zone proved that no matter how big you were, you could be just as memorable, just as engaging as any of their larger counterparts. The Fortress of Fangs, based on the incredibly popular Dungeons & Dragons brand, was a menacing dragon-faced rock formation that seems way too small to deliver. But Advanced D&D made sure to pull out all the stops on something that doesn't seem large enough to use even as a display stand for your figures. Moving spiked wall, trap door and slide, along with a thrown and pop out weapons rack, continued to demonstrate that for such a small playset, it really can pack it in. Phenomenal cosmic powers! However, it is a little deceiving as most of these features can only be experienced by the dwarf or hobbit-like short figures. So that's a major strike against it. She's truly incredible. Gotcha. Can we hear it for the doll of the MTV generation? With a few minor tweaks, this doll figure, which was supported by an action-packed cartoon series, could have gone far. Her storyline was tight. Where it was non-existent with Barbie, Jem had a whole lore. But she was destined to lose. Sadly, she also wasn't winning with her playsets, if you can call them that. Nothing like Barbie's dream house. Jem had a dressing room, workout video room, and stage setup. And don't get me started on the waterbed keyboard. Just like the military base, which seems only designed to display the figures, these playsets were nothing more than glorified dioramas. Cardboard backdrops and plastic bases make for really underperforming playsets. Just ask Buck Rogers or even the Black Hole toy lines. Even if these playsets are the weakest link, they get a pass for being cassette players. They even come with a cassette. Now that's outrageous. One look at the exterior and you might think this flat black paint is pretty undynamic and look a little lazy. But the over 20 inch tall Vulcan Rock is definitely a tier two toy from a tier two, maybe a three toy line. Power Lords have had a little resurgence recently, but let's be honest, the action figure gimmick was just creepy. No matter how you played with Adam Power, he was always looking at you. I'd be so confused, I wouldn't know whether to scratch my watch or wind my butt. Yeah, and what do we have here with these subline of beast machines? They look straight out of Sid's backyard. Power Lord action figures were just so out of left field, they probably should have stayed there, as the 80s toy scene was getting crowded, especially if you didn't bring your own marketing cartoon. As for Vulcan Rock, an elevator, escape hatch, trap door, hidden passages, ladders, and a space bridge. Wow, wonder how that worked. The variety of elements and playability elevates this from second rate, but the line is forgettable, and the playset lost in time. As a kid, there was nowhere I wanted to visit more whenever I heard Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice Then, the Hall of Justice! The Superpowers collection was a bright spot for DC superhero figures. This playset can get anyone excited. The exterior is reminiscent of what we saw so often on Super Friends, and we couldn't wait to get inside. 
In the 70s, we were given many laminated hard cardboard fold-out carrying case playsets like the Star Trek Bridge or the Matchbox Fighting Furies. But this fold-out playset effectively offered more rooms, more playtime, and options for adventures, even if low on action features. And a brash color scheme. Who was their decorator? I do feel as though the Turtles would find inspiration in the Hall of Justice for their popular Technodrome playset six years later. Okay, another stage set, the Pacific Princess for your Love Boat action figures was little more than a dollhouse. Thinking about it, what features would they include on a Love Boat playset? A dumbwaiter for Isaac? Working infirmary for Doc? Or maybe some lowerable life rats for this week's Love Boat guest, the Titanic Iceberg? I'll ask again, who was the audience for this toy line? The Love Boat makes Kenner's Glamour Gals Ocean Queen the Castle Grayskull of fashion dolls. This may have been fun if it could at least float in your pool, but without watertight doors, this toy was a wreck before it even sank. I had no idea this even existed. What about you? With Voltron's popularity, well, at least the Lion Team, I would have expected more success from the Castle of Lions. Did it have mass release in the States? It seems like a pretty well-kept secret, besides being the only playset to actually have its name plastered across the front. I imagine it would have been a treat to get this playset on your birthday or under the tree. Voltron was much loved, and a playset would make sense. The castle is glaring with a non-traditional design and color scheme, but with a fair amount of playability, including, when extended fully, it gives off a futuristic cityscape. It is rounded out with a number of accessories, pop-out guns, and multiple levels for your Lion Color Guard team to interact with. I always thought the RV with the surprise vehicle launching would have been my go-to over the very unprotected headquarters. Perhaps when you're bionic, you don't need walls. However, what this super high-tech laboratory lacks in action features, it makes up for the modular design unique to most playsets. This design allowed you a number of connection options to make playing much more of a construction project and different every time. Bionic 6 was a tier 2 toy line with a lot of fans, but not enough love. Its TV appearance was minimal, and late delivery to toy stores brought the Bionic 6 to a Bionic 0. The Ice Castle for the Black Star line may look imposing on the shelf from the front, but sadly, what could have been, never was. The interior has a lot to be desired, with what I think is a stand-up throne for the Overlord, who may have been too self-conscious about his short shorts to sit down. An image of some little creeper is upstairs in what's supposed to be a hallway, and a small chair to control station is the only other area that can be used for play but there is no feasible way to access it. I'm glad the line had a playset, but the Ice Castle is more like an eyesore. Get it? Bravestar had creative characters and some deeper concepts than other fare at the time. Of course, that is only garnered by the cartoon that accompanied this latter 80s toy line. Marshall Bravestar and his friends can get a little action at Fort Carrion. Just very little. Fort Carrion playset was split into two and sold separately. A central command center and then a set that included both jail and bank. Something to rob and somewhere to go when you're copped. A fairly good scaled set, it could set up straight like a small western street, but I always thought it should have a couple more places like a saloon, a general store, and maybe even a brothel to help fill it out. The set could also fold up into a bunker with armored sides that completely closes it off during attacks from Tex Hex. There were some minor but cool features, even light activated ones, that made this a great accompaniment to the action figures. So Fort Carrium is not second rate, but just a lesser known playset in a tier 2 line. With figures even shorter than those of Kenner's mask, they sure didn't bring the action with the Command Outpost playset like they did with Boulder Hill. The Air Raiders certainly seem to have loyal fans, but has very little room to play inside. Seemingly, like the air in the title suggests, the most interesting aspect is the air-activated avalanche on the back and a couple of air missiles. Good thing this too came with six figures. If the cartoon was created to help market this toy line, the advertise agency should have been fired. There is nothing that connects the two together, and although this base is impressive in size and pieces, the source material has no callback to the animated series and no emotional connection to the kid that might want it, if there were any. It's just a sad box of parts. It looks like the autopsy of a Star Wars gonk droid, and that isn't enough to entice a sale. Sadly, Wheeled Warriors the toy line just doesn't reach its potential, and the battle base is clearly second rate. When you look at the success of the G.I. Joe headquarters, or even Snake Mountain where much of the action features were focused on the outside, the short-lived Sektar's Hive can be compared right alongside the triumph of the greats. So where is their immortality? Truth be told, kids were changing. We already knew the market was flooded as the 80s continued on, 
and there were too many choices. Some of the most famous were beginning to fade away or evolving, while dozens of others fought to place in the toy line race. The height of this playset along with the play features and potential to mix with other toy lines made it a fantastic world for action figures to belong to. But finicky young people were demanding other new things, and playsets as we understood them were becoming a thing of the past. There were some interesting unproduced playsets as well. The teased cardboard layer for Clash of the Titans. That cancellation was what I like to call It was a mercy killing. Then there were more of those empty playhouse type sets like Cooter's Garage for Dukes of Hazard. But there were others like the Visionary's Holodrome. That would have been amazing. It had to be plugged in. Plugged in! I'm in. The power was to generate the real-life hologram promised, but it just never materialized. And I do believe playsets like the Karate Kid Attack Alley and Training Center, as well as the Well of Souls from Indiana Jones, have to have their own movie-based toy line show, don't you? I didn't even mention the limited or non-existent features in some of the biggest toy line franchises. Carolot from the Care Bears and the Paradise Estates from My Little Pony were both robbed. The Ghostbusters Firehouse, which for many of you was a favorite in the later 80s and got kids very excited. What other favorites do you remember? Let's all talk about them in the comments. In the end, playsets were amazing ways to extend playtime, engage the imagination, and allowed for more great adventures with the figures you loved. Some really delivered, but just missed the opportunity to be iconic, while others could just be pitiful, or forgettable at least. It was a glorious time for playsets, and the action features for your favorite characters from franchises made famous in the 1980s. Tell us your memories of these and others, and which you agree were second rate, and which were simply tier 2 toy lines you loved. Thanks for watching and clicking the like. If you haven't subscribed, please don't hesitate to help the channel keep the greatest era alive. The generation that brought us PG films the way they were meant to be. The gen experience. Take a look around the channel, check out more great content, and shop in our store. Thanks for watching, and until next time.